So this is hacking video games. And you already know this presentation is serious because I'm using a light green monospace font. <laughs> Let's talk about me. My name is Horok, I'm from Hungary. I'm a member of the second 8 generation and I work at Game Lab, which is a small Hungarian game developer studio. And I'm also a so-called gamer culture attache of Hackerspace Budapest dot by Steph. Ask me about my penguin later. So what is, what is this talk about? I want to give an example on how video games incorporate hacking into their mechanics. And I won't be able to show too many. And I will only use images, no animations, no live demos, so sorry if you're expecting that. And why there are some niche games catered towards programmers, hacking usually ends up being represented as a really abstract mini game. The goal of this talk is to give an uh, overview of this phenomenon and to follow it up with a workshop to gather input from the hacker scene. What is this not about? I'm not here to talk about exploits, cheaters, uh, people using wall hacks and aimots. The, this might be another interesting topic for another talk. Uh, I actually did an interview once with a guy who wrote uh, aimbots for an open source FPS, and you can check it out on my blog. Spoiler alert, I asked if he likes cold pizza, and he said no. That was a question I had to ask in the interview. And I do not wish to teach uh, hacking via games, nor to uh, apply game design to any corporate process based on this. So this is purely about how hacking should be represented in games. The first category is Hollywood hacking. We are all aware and in a way kind of fond of how Hollywood represents hacking. Video games are no different. Uh, games of this caliber are Outplaying, Hacknet, Hackmud, I'm pretty sure most of you already know some of them. These games are totally about hacking and only about hacking. As in IT sector, not really the MIT definition. And this is usually represented via monochrome terminals. The next category is cyberspace. There I said it, and probably it triggered the net. There are games, these games are really abstract with a dash of neon. In fact, this is the ultimate abstraction, other than the pen and paper role playing games and maybe computer role playing games based on that, that only do skill checks. They usually feature a movement with six degrees of freedom, shooting down countermeasures, avoiding black eyes, all that cyberpunk bullshit. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love me some cyberpunk, but I really want to see games with uh, hacking closer to real life. The next category is usually uh, in AAA games, <laughs> hold X to hack. This is just a thematic framing for a really simple capturing mechanism, uh, mechanic. The example here is from Titanfall. The guy literally stabs a machine with a data knife. This is truly redefining penetration testing. <laughs> and uh, magic, more magic. Hacking is usually just a superpower. It can do anything, even crazy stuff done in Hollywood hacking. The best example presented here is the Watch Dogs series. This is an IoT nightmare where everything's online and the main character can do all sorts of crazy bullshit. Another example there is uh, Overwatch's uh, Sombra character. Uh, she falls under this category with her holographic terminal and the ability to disable everything, even if it's not uh, based on technology. And uh, this is really my pet peeve. Abstract minigames. Uh, minigame is um, basically a game contained within a game with its own gameplay, unrelated to the game it is, it is inside. The bottom picture is Pipe Mini or Pipe Dream. This is really the trope codifier used in Bioshock as seen on the screenshot. Or Star Trek Elite Force 2 is uh, using the same mechanic as well. The other notorious uh, game using similar mechanics to this is Mass Effect. The other two screenshots are from different Mass Effect games. The one to the left is from the PC version of Mass Effect 1. Uh, when the character initiates a um, hacking sequence, you basically play Frogger, a really abstract Frogger. And uh, the other is, again, just uh, find a matching images mini game, and it also has a, a Simon Electronic memory game. So my problem is that <clears throat> uh, they all ha have something in common. They, have al they always have a time pressure involved, and you have limited attempts. And do you, they really do not represent the action the avatar, the player character, takes 
uh, in the play uh, in the world in the game, and they do not always fit the style of the game world either. Why is this? Blame Hollywood. Uh, movies portray hacking as they do because screen time is limited and precious. Action has to be fast, interesting, but this doesn't translate one to one to games. I mean. A uh, character doesn't have to type furiously. In real life, we stare at screens, but this is totally okay in a turn-based game. Uh, also, there is the rule of fun. As TV Trope says, it's an acceptable break from reality. We have to assume that the player's action represent the avatar struggle in the game. Uh, it has to bridge the fun and realism, and I actually have to quote this from the page. Who wants to sit there and exploit security flaws when you can just use a green tank to shoot stuff? Because, yeah, it's usually better to have deep systems than complex ones, and the game needs to be fun or satisfy the player some other need. Uh, but there are some good examples out there. For example, uh, both of these games are really fantastical, meaning that they are not realistic at all. Uh, Quadrilateral Cowboy, for example, builds on uh, the Hollywood hacking tropes, and it has some cyberpunk feeling to it, but it really expands on hacking. It's not just a collection of color matching minigames. You have to examine systems and deconstruct them. And by the way, it's using it Tech 4, the engine that was running uh, uh, under Doom 3, and its own source code was published under the GNU general, uh, general public license, if you're interested. The other example here is uh, uh, Gunpoint. In Gunpoint, you can manipulate the building's electronics, like uh, rewire what switches turn on and off, and uh, you can manipulate the guards and other obstacles in the game to reach your goal. Uh, what I'm calling teams here are really hacking techniques featured or, uh, in games, usually like social engineering, password cracking, the same stuff as in movies. On the other hand, uh, the um, stuff listed on the other column is less represented. I really want to see them in games as mechanics. So let's talk about games. What are games anyway? As we go on down this list, we define its requirements. Yeah, now I'm going to give a, a crash course on game design, so embrace yourself. Uh, narrative is not interactive at all. Even if it has branching uh, trees, it's still hand-built and it has no emergence. A toy is a system that has no prescribed goals. You can play around with it. Forgot to mute my phone. <laughs> and a puzzle has a solution, but and uh, you have a goal uh, to find this solution. <laughs> Level down, you have a contest. Give me a sec here. Sorry for that. So in a contest, the play session is usually limited, like there is a time limit or something, and this allows for measurement, and it's usually designed to be unsolvable. And uh, we finally reach games. Games have clear goals, and they usually ob obfuscate measurement, and they can feature incomplete information, but it's all about decision-making and feedback. I want to talk about player types here really quickly. This is Bottle's taxonomy, originally uh, created to categorize MUD and MMO players. Uh, MUD is, stands for multi-user dungeon, MMO is uh, massive multiplayer online games. It has been adopted by game designers, uh, used to det uh, determine target groups and cater design based on the needs. Single and multiplayer games have different appeals to these type of players. First, we have the killers. They are competitive in nature. They really prefer conflict with other players and AI. The achievers, on the other hand, like to gain points, levels, equipment, and all their concrete measurement. The socializers really love to interact with other players and characters, more than the game itself. And the explorers enjoy discovering areas, creating maps, learning about hidden places, so really like to explore the game itself, the game world itself. So game design is really about gameplay. I really want to stress this because there is a common mis misconception that game design is uh, the audiovisual design and the narrative design. These things have to work together in harmony and they all have to support each other, but we're talking about the interactive games here. So if there's a conflict, game design has to have the priority here. So gameplay is about, uh, this is the MDA framework. There are, other, there are other schools out there, but uh, the MDA framework says that gameplay can be broken down into um, mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. Mechanics design, I mean, I'm describe the game components. 
while Dynamics described the runtime behavior of these mechanics and uh, acting on the player and puts them working together with other mechanics. So these form systems. While Aesthetics describe the desired emotional response evoked in the player when they interact with the game systems. Uh, here's an example on how to break down these into so-called add-ons. Like, in this case, jump is a verb. This is a very typical stuff to use in game design. What are the verbs? Verbs are the stuff the player does most of the time. So you can uh, really base on your, your core mechanic based on the action the player takes most of the time. And uh, when we're doing the workshop, I really want you to define these verbs. Here's a simple flowchart, it's, it's really oversimplified. You can see the core gameplay, uh, core gameplay loop in the middle. It features a core mechanic. Uh, as I said, this is the, what the player does most of the time. And it can have secondary and additional layers of mechanics on top of that, and they have to support the core in harmony. And uh, a core gameplay loop has to have a, a win condition and an optional fail state. Uh, when we're doing the workshop, you don't need progression and narrative, just keep it simple. So what is my goal with this? Uh, it would be great if hacking could be represented in gameplay abstract enough to work in any type of game uh, that doesn't revolve around hacking. And uh, what can we do to achieve this? Uh, please help me with this workshop and let us design hacking minigames. Uh, what are we building here is not even a prototype, uh, just a high level concept really. A uh, prototype would require iterative design based on playtesting and you don't have to define mechanics and break them into atoms like I showed just now. What I really want is to capture the feeling of hacking, not to make a realistic simulation uh, or teach gamers how to hack. So design rules, goals and potentially mechanics that are not too far removed from uh, what you experience while you're doing your everyday hacks. And it doesn't even have to be a video game, really. It can be a card game, a tabletop game, a pen and paper role-playing game, a live-action role-playing game, whatever. So think of it as a, as a hackathon, like a, a, a nano hackathon. I would like to ask you to work in small groups and treat this as a game. Particip uh, participation is optional, and it's totally okay to fail. I won't judge. I'm gonna give you some creative constraints and a really tight time limit. And uh, I'm gonna give you a framework that will help you even if you haven't designed a game before. You can build it now and if you like it, we can polish it later. And uh, you already know how to think in terms of systems and most of you can probably draw a flow chart. So I have some em empty sheets of paper for you to doodle on before you answer the questions here. And I'm gonna give you some themes and mechanics, but they are really optional, you don't have to use them. It's only there so you don't start with a blank paper. So you have to, some idea where to go to. And that's it, let's jam. <laughs> right, you guys have any questions? Yeah? What is dumpster diving in the context of games? Oh yeah, uh, well, uh, it's not really in context of games because I haven't seen in games. Uh, this is, you know, a mechanic in, well, mechanic, a technique you can utilize. If you want to retrieve some useful information, people just throw out, like, you know, manuals. It's not that relevant nowadays, but it was a pretty useful stuff to do around, you know, corporate garbage bins. Mm, I got it. Yeah. So it, I think it can translate well to games. Yeah, I yeah, think you said you want to convey the feeling of yeah. hacking. Yeah. And it's super frustrating. I know. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it is not it's something that is fun. Games can be frustrating. I mean, you probably don't know, but there are games out there, still popular mainstream games, that are hard as nails. I mean, Nintendo hard. <laughs> like, Old school Nintendo hearts. Like you yeah. fail a lot, you die a lot. Harder than empty heart? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not a good term to use anymore because Nintendo games nowadays are not hard at all. I mean, they, they, they hold your hand and there are no lives anymore. Even if you die, the game just offers to play through itself without you. Uh, what I meant is there are games out there in which you 
fail a lot and you learn from your failures and you have clear goals you want to reach and you get better as a player, not as a character, as a player. And I think this frustration can be totally translated into um, a team for video games. It's completely okay to fail. Any other questions? If not, then uh, I have some fancy papers here. Let's do a workshop. Yeah, I don't know if you want to record a workshop itself, probably not, because people are going to walk around, so that's it for the video. Thanks again.